All right, Shalom, Shalom. First off, give our praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bashem, Yahweh Shai, Bashem, Rakhadash, the bondage to the apostles and the elders of GMS, salute and honors to the elect, all the brothers across the four corners who are enduring in truth and sincerity, all the men, the women, and the children who follow. So, as you can see, this uh, lesson is entitled They Hold Themselves Not Guilty. All right, referencing Zechariah 11 and 5, it says, Who, uh, Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. All right, so that's, that's the so called white man's attitude, okay, um, as to looking towards or back, back at uh, you know, the slave trade and to slavery in general, okay, they. Hold themselves not guilty. All right. When, you know, that literally, that was them in the reincarnation. That was them. But uh, let me grab this in the midst of that. It's uh, Ecclesiastes 41 and 7. It says, well, I started at 6. It says, the inheritance of sinners' children shall perish. And their posterity, okay, their children, all right, they're in, uh, perpetual lying, so to speak, shall have a perpetual reproach. The children will complain of an ungodly father because they shall be reproached for his sake. So that's that's what's going on. You know, you have these so-called white men, they say, oh, well, that wasn't me. You know, we shouldn't have to pay for the sins of our father. But hey, the, the scriptures say, uh, prepare us, uh, let's uh, get that real quick, and then you know, we'll get into the actual crux of the lesson. Um, Isaiah 14 and uh, 21 it says, Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fate nor fill the face of the world with cities. So, because of all the evil deeds that were done during slavery. All right, the people who are present in these times will pay for it. All right, so it says, whose possessors slay them. We were a possession at a point in time. All right, we were owned by the so-called white man. Just like you uh, you own your woman or you own a pair of shoes or your favorite jacket, they had their favorite nigga, okay? It says, and hold themselves not guilty. So, th so now they don't want any guilt associated with them. They don't want no smut on their name because they, quote, didn't physically have us in, in slavery. Or it says, and they that sell them say, blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. So back then they actually believed that the Lord was dealing with them to, to bring such a, a people to have underneath them. It says, in their own shepherds, pity them not. Because we, we couldn't do nothing. We couldn't help each other. We couldn't help them. All right. They can, no Israelites came to help us, and we couldn't help them. As the scripture says in uh, Deuteronomy, it says, um, Deuteronomy 28, 68, it says, and the Lord, not the so-called white man, okay, not not the uh, the Arabs, not the, the, the Hamite Africans, okay, it says, the Lord shall bring ye shall bring thee into Egypt slavery again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more again, and th there ye should be sold unto your enemies for bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. Right, nobody's gonna save you. All right. No one was able to save us. So that's why we're in the condition that we're in uh, until this day. Okay, so our own shepherds pitied them not, right? So now that we have a, a, a base for the for the lesson, let's go into this article that I found. Okay. Because it's a lot of it's like it's a lot of how can I put this? Um misinformation. All right, it's a lot of things that weren't taught in schools about the time of uh, slavery and in the times of uh, post-slavery, 
right? It was a, well, what I'll say what we were taught was, you know, slaves were in the South, you know, they did teach us that, you know, there were beatings, hangings, so, so on and so forth. Um, but if you escape to the North, you lived a better life and uh, white people accepted you. You know, you could get a job and work and earn a living. But that wasn't always the case. So this is a, an article from the Smithsonian Magazine, all right? Smithsonian referencing the great museum here in America. It says, uh, this is from August 27th of 2020. It says, how the myth of a liberal North erases a long history of white violence. So like I said, there was always this school of thought that the North, oh, the North freed the slaves. Oh, the North, you, the, we, we, we all, we, we like black people. Or we, we, we didn't, you know, terrorize black people like the South did. But it said they were, it's covered up, man. To put it plain, man. All their wicked deeds are covered, okay? But the scripture says, you know, that uh, everything's going to come to light. So let's, let's go through this article. And, uh, you know, we, you know, Bapa Gosha, you know, you stick with me. And uh, Lord's Lord, this is going to be edifying. It says this article was orig originally pun uh, this article was orig originally published on the blog for the Smithsonian National Museum of American History as the first of a five part series titled Black Life and Two. I can't say that word on here. But, but y'all see it. Uh, histories of violence. John Langston was running through the neighborhood in ruins. Burnt homes and businesses were still smoking. The windows shattered. Langston was only 12 years old, but he was determined to save his brother's life. His brother's lives. He had spent the night in a safe house, sheltering from the white mobs that had attacked the city's African-American neighborhood. Sleep, sleep must have been difficult that night, especially after a cannon was repeatedly fired. The cannon had been stolen from the federal armory by the white mob alongside guns and bullets so they could go to war against black people. Langston awoke to worse news. The mayor had ordered all white men in the city to round up any surviving black man they found, uh, they found uh, and throw him in jail. As Langston would later write, swarms of improvised police officers appeared in every quarter, armed with power and commission to arrest every colored man who could be found. As soon as Langston had heard this, he ran out the back door of the safe house to find his brothers to try to warn them. When a group of armed white men saw Langston, they shouted uh, at him to stop, but he refused, willing to risk everything to save his brothers. And this is a picture of, uh, you know, to digress, but uh, not to digress, but of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Or even Black Wall Street. You know, it looks like World War II. But this is here in America. This is a, a so-called African-American community. All right. That was bombed. Again, it looks like, you know, France in World War II or something. But these places were set on fire. Uh, 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 up and coming not even really up and coming, a thriving black community, okay? Getting commerce from other countries. And they didn't like that, man. So what they do? They had to take it out. But uh, back to the story. All right, it says, 
there's a toxic myth that encourages white people in the North uh, to see themselves as free from racism and erases African Americans from uh, from the pre Civil War North, where they are still being told that they don't belong. What Langston experienced was not the massacre of massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1921, or Rosewood, Florida, in 1923. Look up Rosewood. I believe they have a movie about it as well. This was Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1841, 20 years before the Civil War broke out. This was the third such racist, racist attack against African Americans in Cincinnati in 12 years. So let's see if we can. Let's see. Uh, what is it called? Uh, let me see. So this is the Mason Dixon line. This is basically the. Uh, so the Mason Dixon line, also called the Mason Dixon line, originally the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania in the United States in a pre Civil War period that was regarded together with the Ohio River as the dividing line between slave states south of uh, and south of it and free states north of it, right? So. So we see the Mason-Dixon line. Anything north of this line, there could be no slavery. Anything south of this line, you know, slavery was on the table still. This is Ohio. Clearly above the Mason-Dixon line. Yet, when you read the, the article, 20 years before the Civil War even broke out, they had three racist attacks, even deputizing regular white folk to cause harm to Jake. That's why he says that there's a toxic myth because they hold themselves not guilty. All right, they they cover up what was actually done. They don't want to be associated with, with things like this. It says Cincinnati was not alone. Between 1829 and 1841, white Northerners had been rising up against their most successful African-American neighbors. It says burning and destroying churches, businesses, schools, orphanages, uh, meeting halls, farms, and entire communities. That's what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's what happened in, in, in Rosewood, Florida. All right, this, this is commonplace. There was no safe place to be a Jake, whether you're, uh, uh, you know, Judah Benjamin Levi, whether you're one of the native tribes or one of the Latino tribes, in this time period, there's no safe place for you. Moving on, it says, these were highly organized actions instigated by some of the most wealthy and most educated white citizens in the North. So it wasn't just poor white folk. That, that wanted revenge or felt threatened that, you know, oh, they're going to take our jobs, this, that, and the third. No, the business owners, the bankers, high society, they were the ones who were funding these actions. Okay. It says, um, as, a, as a white gentleman in the pretty rural uh, village of Catterbury, Connecticut, wrote in 1833, the colored people can never rise from their menial condition in our country. 
They ought not be permitted to rise here. They ought not be permitted to rise here. Meaning we need to keep them down. We need to keep them under our foot. But I thought that was just the South. I thought that that was just, you know, the, the slave owners, the, the, the plantation owners mentality. No, that was white folk, so-called white folk mentality. It says, these were highly, uh, Slaki, let me see. It says, he wrote this after white members of his community tried to burn down an elite private academy for African-American girls while the students slept inside. So they can't even do it, you know, um, to, to men. To, speaking of this act, you know, they didn't want to, they didn't want to smoke with men. They wanted to go, you know, get some little girls. Which shows the spirit that they had, but that's a totally different thing. You know, I guess a nigga's a nigga, right? It says, one of the girls who survived the fire uh, then made the long journey to Canaan, New Hampshire. Ironically, you know, she made it to Canaan, our land the, of Israel, originally the land of Canaan. Okay, it says where few abolitionists or a few abolition, abolitionists were trying to establish in and here's the problem, an integrated school <laughs> called the Noise uh, Academy. All right. Anytime you try to integrate, man, you, you're going to get a problem because, you know, there's matter of fact, let me, uh, let me get this. It says uh, Ezekiel 35 and five, it says, because thou has had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity in the time that their iniquity had an end. All right. So, there's always been a, that perpetual hatred from the womb, okay, between Jacob and Esau. So when you try to integrate the two, you're going to have a problem. So we, we heard the stories about in Mississippi, how, you know, uh, integrating the schools, how, how, you know, all the trouble that they went through. Well, shit. This is in New Hampshire. You don't get no more north than that. All right, it says in Canaan, uh, Canaan was a remote and lovely village, but within months, white locals attacked that school. The white attackers brought in numerous teams of oxen attached to a chain they put around the school and pulled it off its foundation, dragging it down the main street of Canaan. Now, can you imagine a whole school being dragged down the street? Why? Because of integration. They didn't want white folk mixing with color folk. All right. They didn't want them light-skinned babies. Because ultimately that's what happens, right? When you, when you mix the two cultures, they know who we are. They can feel it in the spirit. That's why they women flock to us like they do. That's why the, the so-called uh, white populace is declining. Because you have a whole, you got a whole lot of uh, black men who are dating white women. And not enough white women who are still dating white men. So that's a declining community. Because once they go black, <laughs> they just don't go back. But that's that's the school of thought. That's why they wanted to do this. That's well, that's not the full reason, but that's definitely, you know, um one of the, the, the catalysts of, of wanting to keep the two culture separated because they didn't want to intertwine and intermingle the blood. All right. White men wanted their white daughters to date white men and have white babies. 
right? Because you are who your father is. All right, so uh, in 1834, there were even more riots against African Americans, most notably in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, Philadelphia, and in New York City. The mayor of New York allowed the destruction of African American homes and businesses to continue for days before finally calling out the state militia. This violence was not against buildings alone, but accompanied by atrocities against African Americans, including grape and castration. So if you was a woman, hey, they just took it. They took the cookie. And if you was a man, they chopped off your manhood. All right. It's a form of a uh, of psychological control. You are know, you, you what's what's the worst thing you can do to a woman? Is force yourself apart. And how do you demasculate a man? <laughs> you, you take his manhood literally. All right. African Americans in the North bravely continue to call for uh, equality and the ending of slavery, while the highest officials in the land tried to encourage uh, tried to encourage more massacres. So while you know we were calling, "Hey, man, you need to end slavery. We need to you know do what's right." They're saying, "Man, fuck you. They're spitting in your face. We need to kill more of you." As Lacey Ford revealed in his book, Deliver Us from Evil, President Andrew Jackson's Secretary of State, John Forsyth, wrote a letter asking Vice President Martin Van Buren, born and raised a New Yorker, to organize a little more mob discipline, adding, the sooner you set the imps to work, the better. Right? So it says, the violence continued. Historian Leonard Richards uh, makes a conservative estimate uh, of at least 46 mobbings in northern cities between 1834 and 1837. 46 in a three-year period. All right. Hey, and there's, there's a lot more information just like this. Is what is, well, I guess I can I can read the rest of it. Fuck it, you know we're here. <clears throat> it says white leaders in Cincinnati gathered in speaking halls to encourage another attack against African Americans in the city uh, in 1836. Ohio Congressman Robert Little uh, helped to lead one of these rallies. As Leonard Richard noted in his book, Gentlemen of Property and Standing, the words he thundered to his audience were so vile that even the local newspapers tried to clean them up. <laughs> Changing the words and blanking them out, printing the quote that read, uh, the, co- the, the colonel urged the crowd to castrate the men and blank the women. Well, we already know we just went went over that. It says, but the white people in the crowd did not hear this sanitized version. They heard a demand for atrocities. And soon there was another attack against African Americans in that city. Two years later, uh, Lytle or Little was made major general of the Ohio militia. So he gained rank by terrorizing Jake. He made his name off terrorizing Jake in the North. He was probably, let's see if we can look up uh, this uh, Major General Lytle and see if he fought in the war. To well, we, We're going to get into that too.
Let's see, he fought in the Mexican American War. Uh, let's see, Ohio. Oh, he was a poet. He fought in the American Union. So, <laughs> ironically, this guy who hates uh, a so-called African American so much that he fought in, with the with the North <laughs> to to free the slaves. Right? That's what the whole Civil War was about: freeing the slaves. Right? Or was it? We're gonna get into that. I'm glad I, I did keep going on because you see the 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 contradiction. In one sense, he's talking about castrate the men and grape the women. But not not too long after that. Though okay, okay, this is Robert. Was, was that the right guy? Is that the right guy? This is William Lido. Well, what, what's up with Robert Lido? See. Hmm. That's probably him in the reincarnation. <laughs> Let me see. Could be the same guy. The names could be mixed up. Could be a brother. Uh... The time periods fit, the name fits, the uh, first name does not. So, uh, Cincinnati, the time periods fit. Let's see. Y'all be y'all bear with me. Let's say what year this is eighteen thirty six, so about eighteen thirty eight he was made general. This could be his son. See if we can look at the Lytle family. This would definitely have to be his son if he was born in 1826 and the other one took place in uh, 38. So more than likely, this is his son. So he may not have fought to free the slaves so to speak. <laughs> I'm being very facetious with that. But his son did. And it looks like they have a a history of, you know, fighting in wars. The Lido served in the French and Indian War, the American Revolutionary War, the Mexican American War, and the Civil War. All right, hmm. you learn something every day. This 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 has to be, uh, yeah, this would have to be the son. It's like the William is a family name that they passed down. Didn't mention his father. All right, so back to regular schedule programming. 
It says uh, in 1838, Philadelphia saw, uh, again saw white people organized to destroy black schools, churches, meeting halls, and printing presses. And then finally, uh, Pennsylvania Hall. Over 10,000 white people gathered to destroy the hall, one of the grandest in the city. Pennsylvania Hall was newly built in 1838 with public funds and was meant to be a national center for abolitionism, or the freedom of, let's, let's get this word. All right, abolitionism, if you don't know what an abolitionist is, it says uh, the movement to end slavery. So there was a whole movement to end slavery, right? You had Frederick Douglass, you know, Harriet Beecher, Stowe, um, William Lloyd. Yeah, black folk, white folk, all come together to end slavery. And this is what they thought about it, right? They burnt the hall down in the north, in Philly. It says for abolitionism uh, and equal rights, its upper floor had a beautiful auditorium that could seat 3,000 people. It had taken years of fundraising by African Americans and sympathetic white folk, sympathetic white people, uh, for the hall to be built. But it took just one night for it to be destroyed. This destruction was quickly followed by violence by white Pennsylvania politicians who rewrote the state's constitution excluding free African Americans from the right to vote. An overwhelming majority of white men in Pennsylvania enthusiastically voted for the new constitution because they wasn't fucking with Jay. Don't get it fucked up. Their physical destruction of African-American neighborhoods followed by the stealing of African-Americans' rights was double-edged violence, was, was a double-edged violence. And it was not unique to Pennsylvania. Back in 1833, in Canterbury, Connecticut, the girls managed to escape their school when it was set on fire, but soon all African-Americans in Connecticut were made to suffer. White lawyers and politicians in Connecticut saw to that. A lawsuit brought against Prudence Crandall, director of the school, resulted in the highest court in Connecticut deciding that people of color, enslaved or free, were not citizens of the United States. So we, we weren't even citizens at this point. And we're going to get into that. You know, Lord's will, you know, y'all, y'all bear with me. You know, if you're still here, you know, the water and, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's get this knowledge. It says, um, the highest court in Connecticut deciding that people of color enslaved or free were not citizens of the United States. White people can now pass any racist laws they pleased, including one to make it illegal for any person of African descent to enter the state of Connecticut to be educated there. So you, you better not even come over here to try to <laughs> get a book or anything. You niggas are not welcome. While the 1830s saw an intense period of this violence, white northerners had a long history of attempting to control the actions of black people. They had been doing so since the, the colonial period when... Uh, race-based slavery laws made all non-white subjects of suspicion. In 1703, the Rhode Island General Assembly not only recognized race-based slavery, but criminalized all black people and American Indians when they wrote. So let's read. In 1703, Rhode Island General Assembly not only recognized race-based slavery, but criminalized all black people and American Indians, right? So, A, the children of uh, Judah and the, and the children of Israel were oppressed together, all right? Like I said, it wasn't sa safe to be any type of former tribe of Jake during these times. 
says, if any Negroes or Indians are fr either freemen, servants, or slaves, do walk in the street of the town of Newport or any other town in this colony after nine o'clock at night without a, cert uh, without a certificate from their masters or some English person of uh, said family with them or some lawful excuse for the same that it should be lawful for any person to take them up and deliver them to a constable. So basically, a hey, you niggas better not come out at night, man. After nine o'clock, man, it's free. It's free game on y'all. You better have a certificate. You better have a purpose to be out here. You better be with a with a liaison. You can't just roll through here. Didn't matter if you had an emergency, your wife is in labor, you had to go to the hospital, or so on. It didn't even matter, man. Don't be white or don't don't be black at night, man. It says northern slavery began to fall apart during the American Revolution, uh, but the dissolution of race-based bondage was a long and protracted process, and black people were held in bondage in northern states well into the 1840s, which a lot of people don't know that, okay? They, they, there's always this separation between the North and the South, but hey, all, slavery was legal in the North. Slavery was legal in the North. It's just uh, the way America is set up, you have uh, countrywide laws, and then you have state laws, right? Just like you pay uh, taxes to the to the federal government, and then you pay state taxes as well. There's federal law, and then there's state law. Just like it's federal prison, and there's state prisons. Okay. But, you know, that's a whole nother thing. But slavery was was allowed in these states. And then each individual state um, made, made it a part of their own personal constitution to uh, get rid of slavery. So people in the North, don't let it fool you. All right. They didn't like black people. They... They still had disdain. They had them in derision. They had them in slavery. <coughs> and they had to give up their slaves. It says, most northern states enacted gradual emancipation laws to legally dismantle slaveholding. However, it was the actions of black people themselves. Freedom suits writing and publishing abolitionist uh, pamphlets, petitioning, self-purchase, military service, flight, and revolting that made this a reality. And you can see that it's underlined. And we're going to get into this word emancipation. Matter of fact, this is a good transition right now. All right, so let's get this word. Emancipate, right? So when you when you break the word down, ex meaning out or away, emancipare, which means to deliver, transfer, or sell, emancipum, uh, ownership, and then manus is hand. So basically, you're transferring out ownership from hand to hand all right this is an exchange it says not used by romans in the reference to freeing of slaves so it's not talking about freeing a slave all right that was that's new speak okay that's 1776 
1850s, 1620s, so on and so forth. We're talking about the original word. Okay, so let's go into Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Okay, emancipate says to set free uh, from restraint, control, or power of another. Right, then it's using you know these other uh, newer definitions, but it's a transitive verb. What does that mean? Okay. Transitive. It says characteristic by having or containing a direct object, being or relating to a relation with the property, right? Remember, we're slaves, we're property. That if the relation of the relation holds between a first element and a second, and between the second element and the third, it holds between the first and the third elements. So basically, it's a transition going from one to the to the second, from the second to the third, right? So we were slaves in the South, okay? And then we were so-called set free only to be slaves in the North, all right? And I don't want to jump the gun, but we're going to get to, you know, this this transaction because that's really what it was is a transition from from being in slaves in the south to just being slaves in general everyone's a slave so did the emancipation proclamation automatically give slave citizenship because remember Let's go back in here. Uh, let me see. I passed it. Oh, yeah. In Philadelphia. They didn't want to give uh, Jake the right to be. Um, it's, it's in here. It's so much. You y'all y'all remember, man? They didn't want to give Jake uh, citizenship. They they revoked it. Here it is, uh, Connecticut, I guess. It says a lawsuit brought in Prudence against Prudence Crandall. Uh, here, it, yep. Deciding that people of color, enslaved or free, were not citizens of the United States, white people can now pass any racist law they pleased, including one making it illegal. For any person of African descent to enter the state or Connecticut or to be educated there, right? So you weren't a, you weren't a citizen, right? Even though you were free and in the United States, you were not a citizen. So the the so-called Emancipation Proclamation did not give you citizenship. Neither did it make slavery illegal. The Emancipation proclamation simply made it a war goal to rid the U.S. of slavery. Now, what is the proclamation? An act of making public that which is proclaimed, a calling out or a crying out. So basically, <clears throat> they were calling out or making it public that there's going to be a transfer from one slavery to the next. That's what the Emancipation Proclamation essentially is, was, and ever will be. Now, let's go into these uh, amendments, right? These laws that, that gave so-called black people their, um, their freedom. Going to the 13th Amendment, it says, uh, what is the 13th Amendment in simple terms passed by Congress on January 31st, 1865, and ratified on December 6th, 1865, says the amendment abolished slavery in the United States. So now you can no longer have slaves in the United States via the 13th Amendment, right? 
So let's go to the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment gave equal protection and other rights. It says all persons born or naturalized in the United States uh, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state where they reside. So now going back to Connecticut or Pennsylvania, whatever it was, that said that you niggas couldn't be, could not be uh, citizens. Well, now they don't have a choice but to allow you to be a citizen of the United States, right? Now, you would think, because to, to the simple or to um, the average eye, well, there you go. They're trying to make everybody equal, right? They're giving black people a chance, right? Well, let's, let's keep going. What's the 15th Amendment? It says, the 15th Amendment is that the right of citizens of the United States to vote should not be denied or abridged by the United States or by uh, any state on account of race, color, or previous constitution of servitude, condition of servitude. So now, okay, you get the right to vote, yada, yada. What's the 16th Amendment? The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without a apport- apportionment among several states without the regard of any census or enumeration. So now they can tax your ass. You are a citizen now. You were a slave. You weren't a citizen. You weren't even a man. Now you are a citizen, and guess what? You are expected to go to work so I can tax your ass. That's why Lincoln so-called freed the slaves. It's it's because it, you, you're still a fucking slave, man. It's still slave labor. And, you know, I go into this a lot, and we're going to go into it on this one. This is a capitalist Demetrio Maxima. Okay, according to Black's Law Dictionary, the second edition, the definition, and, you know, uh, the elder uh, Saki, the Apostle Gabar, you know, he he's the one who who uh, put this out there a while ago. I believe, you know, the starting with Apostle Gabar, but, you know, all the apostles. The highest or most comprehensive loss of status. Okay. This occurs when a man's condition is changed from one freedom to uh, from one freedom to one of bondage when he became a slave. So we were slaves, we were set free. And now you're a slave again. Going back to the emancipation, right? It's a transition from one slavery to the next. So that's why when when um what does it mean when uh, uh, look at your social security card, look at your your ID, your name is in all capitals, right? We just read that uh with capital capitalist Demisio Maxima, your name in all caps, okay, diminishes you to the maximum amount. So you can see on all your legal documents, your name is in all capital letters, right? This is how your name's supposed to look, right? This is how your name looks on paper. And matter of fact, let's let's get into that. Let me see if I can pull up. Uh, I don't want to do this on YouTube, so hopefully this work on uh, on Rumble. We're gonna watch a little video.
All right, Lordswell, that uh, that play that you were able to hear that, I'll leave a link in the description. But there's a difference between uh, you and, and your, your straw man, so to speak, okay? Lordswell, that play, man, if it didn't, you know, we got to pause the video and Bubba Kusha, check it out and then come back over here. But um, as you can see, there's a separation between you, the actual person, and you, you know, the 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 man on the piece of paper. So now that Jake are on this piece of paper, let's see if we have um. Now in as of nineteen thirty six, that's when social security numbers came out. It says uh, the social security number was created in nineteen thirty six for the sole purpose of tracking the earnings history of U.S. workers, determining and is used for determining Social Security benefits, entitlements, blah, 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 blah. It's tracking the earnings. We need to know how much you get, how much you make, so we can get our cut. So that's why Jake was so-called emancipated because at the end of the day, what is this Social Security leading to? To the MOTB. All right? It's all coming to a head, man. Let me see. Uh, no, I don't need that. Is there anything else that, that we were going over? Hopefully now, you know, y'all have an idea on where I was getting to dealing with this subject. I know there's a couple more precepts that I didn't get that I need to read. Something's going on with, with Blue Letter Bible right now. So uh, we'll read this one. This is uh, Ecclesiastes 12 and uh, starting at 10, it says, Never trust thine enemy, for like as iron resteth, so is his wickedness. So, man, we, we read all the accounts. You know, Jake getting firebombed. They burning down churches and meeting halls, all kinds of stuff, man. You can't trust these people. You know, Jake wanted to integrate. Matter of fact, let's... Right. So, Jake wanted to integrate schools with him. Hey, man, you can't trust these devils, man. Scripture says, what? For like as iron rusteth, so is his wickedness. Though he humble himself and go crouching, yet take good heed and beware of him. Even though he tried to seem like he's your friend, you know, I got three back friends. No, no, no. I didn't have slaves. My my family's from New York. You know, we helped free the slaves. No, you didn't. It's as though he humble himself and go crouching, yet take good heed and beware of him, and thou shalt be unto him as if thou hadst wiped a looking glass. And thou shalt know that his rust have not altogether been wiped away. So he, you can try to hide it. Them true colors is going to come out, man. Now, I will say that every appearance of a white individual doesn't mean that, that they're an Edomite. Because you do have a lot of Jake. who are a, uh, as the scripture says, a speckled bird, right? The wheat and the tares. We, uh, we've seen that the, the violence that was put against us in, you know, what they did to our women. So it was a lot of 
people who appear to be so-called white people that are actually black people, so on and so forth. Going back to my, to the other point that I were making about the integration, why they didn't want us because you have a lot of people who, a lot of white women who lay with black people and made light-skinned babies, okay? And then they went on to have a, because remember back in these times, it wasn't cool to be black. Now, it's cool to be black. And all the white people want to be black. Back then, it wasn't, wasn't too cool. So if you were fair skinned, you tried to pass, right? You tried to pass for a white person. So if you if you are a man, you know, your mom's white and your dad's black, you tried to get with a white woman because you wanted to get your color back. Or, or it's like your, your lack of color. You wanted to try to blend into society. Get a job, right? You don't want to get put in jail, <laughs> you know, when it's time for one of those uh, 46 mobbings to take place. So you got with a white woman and your babies are white and then they got a with a white woman and now their babies are white, so on and so forth. But, uh, Yeah, I, I believe that's it, man. Lord's will, this is edifying. And uh, I just want to give all praise, honor, and glory unto Yahweh, by Hashem, Yahweh Shai, by Hashem, Makar Kadash, double honors to the apostles and the elders of GMS, salutes and honors to the elect, all the brothers across the four corners who are enduring in truth and sincerity, all the men, the women, and the children who follow. Shalom.